We've been considering this thing called prayer. Uh, what is it? Um, how we do it? What scares us about it? Um, and so we're going to do a little recap uh, based on last week. We looked last week at the picture of prayer. And some of you might have come last week um, expecting that there was going to be a picture that I would present about what the picture is. Um, but sometimes that's not the most important thing. Sometimes the most important thing is to ask you what your picture of it is. And then we match it up to what the Bible says, and hopefully God will help us change our picture and help to incorporate more of the correct picture. And that's sort of what last week uh, was all about. Uh, before we go on, just a short video that we're going to watch just to clue our minds back into this thing called prayer. What is prayer? Stale tradition? Ritual? A good luck charm? Part of some religious checklist? Done to appease a higher being so we can get what we want? Or at least avoid the lightning bolt? Prayer has been redefined and twisted and confused. But at its essence, prayer is simply talking to God the God who spoke the universe into creation, who gives us life and breath, who holds all things together. This God wants us to talk to him. In the vastness of all that exists, he actually cares about us, personally, individually. How can we not pray to such a loving God? To understand prayer, we have to asks this question, and the question is, uh, what is prayer and what did God intend it to be from the beginning? We talked a little bit about the way in which we can bring our own experiences to things that the Bible talks about, and in this case, prayer, and we can convince ourselves that we actually know what prayer is all about, but we might be wrong. And so the most important thing to do is, what does God say about prayer? Just ask him and understand what did he, what did he intend for it to be from the beginning. Uh, we also looked at this. Uh, in order to understand what prayer is, we have to look at it in the context of relationship. So we, we talked about um, just how important, you know, every time God is talking about prayer and communication with him, he's not talking about this distance thing. He's talking about a very intimate, loving, close relationship. And so we looked at some pictures that sort of express this. Um, God always has in mind a wholesome relationship um, something that's uh, good, something that's um, beneficial, something that helps persons to uh, fit in and grow. Um, so these were some of the images that we looked at last week. It might mean, you know, a child being propelled forward, knowing that they have their father in back of them so they can go forward as scary as something might be, but in full confidence that dad is right there and daddy has their back. Or... It's the idea of, you know, when as a child we face something difficult, um, we don't necessarily want to be propelled forward at that time, we just want to be comforted. Um, and so when we think about prayer, we're thinking about this in terms of a relationship, in terms of how God wants us to, and that's in a wholesome space where we get what we need. Um, also, this is what the idea is, um, us having a bad day, not knowing what to do, not knowing who else to go to, friends not going to help us in this situation, and we just need to sit and cry and know that our Father is going to be there patiently loving on us and waiting for us and helping us. Uh, and this, this is the last image that we looked at. Again, the image of a child maybe having their worst day, not knowing what to do, but feeling completely comforted and comfortable in the arms of Daddy. And so these are the images that we have to always understand when we're talking about prayer. Prayer is not something that's distance. We talked a little bit last week about um, the kinds of relationships that you and I have in which we would be honest and open. And we talked a little bit about if you're just meeting somebody for the first time or if you went on, in an airplane, um, you don't know that person. So there may be a, a superficial conversa conversation sorry, that you may have with that person, but you're not going to go to the deep parts and be open and honest and all the rest of it because that only takes place in relationship. And so when we're understanding this thing called prayer from God's perspective, he's not asking us to do this from a distance. He's asking us to do this up close and personal in this thing called a relationship with Jesus Christ. So first of all, prayer is relational. 
And this is a quote that uh, we looked at last week from Pastor Chip. A prayer is about keeping company with God and having a conversation that is transformational. Okay? So that's what we're talking about. Now, we also acknowledged last week that for many of us, the concept of wholesome relationships or being comforted or being supported is difficult for some of us because it isn't what we have experienced in our lives here on earth. Okay? But not that we can push that aside, but we still have to fight through it. And by God's grace, he helps us to do this. So it's not to dismiss the experiences that you have had and the unfortunate reality that you can't relate to a great relationship with mom and dad. But while that's still true, we have to fight through that to see things from God's perspective because we can never try to compare the experiences that we've had with what God is offering us. So we always have to keep that in mind. So that was sort of a recap from last week. And so as we go into this week, we're talking about the pattern of prayer. Now, the one thing that we are not trying to do, or I'm not trying to do, is create a formula for prayer. Okay, you can go through the Bible and you can find all kinds of prayers. Some are short, some are long, some are shouts, some are quiet, some are contemplations in the heart, all kinds of prayer. So we're not talking about formula, but we're talking about the right approach as we understand something about this God who, at the beginning, wants us to understand that it's relationship, relationship, relationship. Out of relationship, we talk. God says, I talk to you, you listen, you talk back to me, that's what God is after. And the last thing that we really came away with last week is the understanding that God always, always, always wanted this to be the kind of relationship from the beginning. Sometimes, as we talked last week, we said um, we can have this idea that because sin came into the world, God sort of came up with a fix that said, okay, well, now my people are sort of messed up and sin's broken everything. I need to come up with something so that we can talk or communicate. That's not the reality of how this thing happened. We looked at this, and from the beginning, before sin ever came into the world, God's plan was to have constant communication with his people. So that didn't change. What changed was that the connection was broken. Okay, and through Jesus Christ, he's the one who re-engages that connection so the thing that God always wanted us to experience can be experienced again. And that is the context of prayer in relationship, okay? So that's a little recap for those of you who weren't here last week. So the next question is, how do we pray? How do we pray? One of the things that the disciples ask Jesus Christ is, they were looking and understanding that John the Baptist, he had some disciples. John was a teacher. He came before Jesus to uh, show the way or prepare the way for Jesus. And apparently, John had taught his disciples to pray because the disciples of Jesus came to Jesus one day and said, Jesus, you teach us to pray. John taught his disciples to pray. We don't know how to pray. Can you teach us to pray? So the first thing I want us all to realize is that we have to learn how to do it. Nobody comes out learning how to pray. We all come out with this instinct that says, God, I'm in trouble, I'm gonna call out to you, because I think that's a God-given thing that he's put in there for the beginning. But how we do it, uh, we don't necessarily know. So if you're here today and you feel as if, you know, your prayers are hit and miss, or it's like, you know what, um, my prayers, they go two feet high and then they collapse. Or I only pray on prayer meeting nights. So I can't even pray on prayer meeting nights because I'm still getting used to like holding someone's hand or not holding someone's hand or being in a group and praying. And that freaks me out. That scares me to death. That's okay. That's probably how the disciples came to this thing. But they asked Jesus, Jesus, teach us to pray. So for every single one of us, we have to approach this the same way. Maybe we have gotten to the habit of praying in a certain way or thinking we're praying in a certain way or doing things in a certain way. And it's fine. But be okay learning something new about this thing called prayer. Because in the Bible, it's one of the constant realities that you see. This thing of God reaching out to man and God inviting man to reach back out to him. So if it's something that's important, then we should learn how to do it so that we can pray more and more. Now, we're going to look at Genesis 4.26. This is the first time in the Bible where... Um, you find this, 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 this innate need to call on God. Uh, in Genesis 4, it says, at that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. The Bible doesn't tell us what happened. 
The Bible doesn't tell us all of the details, but fair enough to say something probably went wrong. The Bible doesn't give all of the details, but it was a time period and, you know, sin was on the earth and things were going on, and it's just like out of the blue, it says, at that time, people began to call on the Lord. Gen Jeremiah 33 tells us this, call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things that you do not know. So again, God has always, from the beginning, one, given us a desire to call out to him, but we talked about last week how sin has caused us to run from that or hide from that, so we don't necessarily talk to him in the same way that he would want us to, but through Christ we can get that back and we can do that more. But in Jeremiah here, God is telling Jeremiah, call to me, just call to me, call to me. And the idea of call is a, it's an audible call. It's just call. Talk to me, I will answer you, and then I'll respond. I'll tell you some great and unsearchable things that you do not know. Matthew 7, this is Jesus. He says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. So God has always given this invitation to every single one of us to talk to, just to talk to, just to communicate with him. Sometimes we can come to God and say, well, you know, God only listens to my mom or he won't listen to me. And now there may be some reasons that we have to, you know, work through to understand the reality of prayer, but it isn't because God doesn't want to talk to you. If you're here and you think that you're wrong, if you think as if God doesn't want to speak to you, it's just not true. God loves us enough to give us his word so that we can appreciate his heart for us. God wants to communicate with you. So always remember that, okay? So if there's a problem in terms of the communication, guess what? It isn't God's fault. There's something that we have to appreciate and learn and understand so that we can communicate with God. But God always invites us to talk with him. So we're going to look at Philippians chapter 4. This is a familiar passage of scripture, um, and we're going to look and trust God to help us learn how he wants us to pray, what it's all about, and what we can expect from God. And I think that's one of the keys to praying. Sometimes we can pray, and we're hoping for the best, but we're not really understanding what we can expect from God. Because sometimes in our minds, we pray, and it's almost as if we know we prayed, and we know God's heard us, if the thing that we prayed about changes. Now, God can do that, and he wants us to pray about those things. But that isn't necessarily the only thing that we should be expecting from God when we pray. So having the right expectation will help us to want to pray more. And I believe God's going to help us to, to, to go through that as we go through Philippians. So let's read these few verses. Uh, Philippians 4, verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. In Philippians 4, Paul gives us a clue by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit how it is that we should communicate with God. And we're going to look at four different words for prayer. Do not be anxious about anything. First thing to appreciate is that life can be full of anxiety. I think that's what happened in Genesis 4, 26 that we just looked at. Doesn't say what happened, but there was some anxiety that welled up and people just started calling on the name of the Lord. Um, and so if you and I are honest, of course, we go through difficult situations. Anxiety gets the best of us sometimes. And so God wants to give us an understanding of how we should pray even during anxious times. Do not be anxious, Paul says, but about anything, but in every situation by prayer, and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. So what we're going to look at is all four of these instances, which all are kinds of prayers, they're all kinds of communications to God, but they're all different. And so as we look at the differences, so what's the difference between prayer as it's used there, and then petition as it's used there, and thanksgiving, and request, and I think God is going to help us to understand a bit more about this thing called prayer. The first thing that is underlined there is prayer. The word that is used there is the word that suggests adoration. It's the word that sets us up from the beginning to appreciate that God is God, 
and we're not. It's the, it's the word that means, you know what, I need to be in awe of God constantly. Now, it doesn't mean that I'm automatically dismissing the situation that I'm going through, but it does mean that regardless of the situation, God is still God. And so, when we come to the conclusion that God is a big God, our problems seem smaller. But if we come to the conclusion that our problems are big and God's small, then we're going to have anxious moments and nothing's really going to move forward. But so what Paul is inviting us to understand here is that we need to adore God. We need to put him in his rightful place. We need to understand how significant God is. Doesn't mean that we're dismissing our situation, but we're giving God praise. Now, this is something that I think, again, we have to learn how to do. It's something that God still teaches me how to do, but I'm thankful that he gave me the opportunity to learn science from a young age, and that was my career before pastoring. And I think he did that because he knows in many respects how stubborn I am and how up face, how close I need to be with who he is to really grasp how awesome he is. I really believe that. So when I was studying science and doing conservation work, you know, I had some great experiences, some volcano walks and, you know, alligators, you know, crocodiles and all of that stuff. And it was really, really cool. But I got to study this thing and I got to appreciate that, man, God, you are amazing. You are absolutely amazing. The things that you're showing me, the things that I'm studying about, I can't even fathom how you did it. But I'm convinced that you did. So what I want to encourage you with is this. In Psalm 19, it says that the heavens declare the glory of the Lord. So sometimes, to appreciate the splendor of God, we need to just get outside, go for a walk, sit by the water, be amazed at what he's done. This is one of the things that God says he wants us to appreciate about what he's made and who he is. This isn't just a nature truck, a tree hugger saying, look, let's go outside. God saying, go outside, check out the stuff that I've done, and be amazed by it. And I think this was the heart that David had. David was a shepherd boy. He would lie out there with his sheep, and he would make sure they were safe and protected. But then I can picture David just laying back in, this, in the forest, you know, in the grass, looking up and maybe counting the stars and having this dialogue with God. Because David had this perspective of God is awesome. God's big. God's strong. And that's the same place that you and I have to um, approach God from. So we have to learn how to praise God. We have to learn how to adore God. In Psalm 103, verse 1 to 4, it says this. You can write that down and you can read it a little bit later, but I'm just going to read it. It says, praise the Lord, my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. We have to learn to give God praise. We have to learn to adore God. We have to learn to put God in his rightful place. And that is the word that is first used here in terms of the remedy or the antidote for being anxious and being stuck in a place, the thing that's going to hinder us from praying to God. So prayer, we have to learn to praise God and adore him. The second word is the word petition. And this word suggests confession. It, it, it's the idea of God, you know this situation, you know it's big, I understand how big it is, and I understand that I am so limited that I can do nothing about it, but I also understand that you are so big and you can do everything. It's the idea of just not even really addressing the details of the thing, but we put God in this perspective in terms of worshiping him, but now it's like, well, God, I'm so limited. There's no way that I can affect this change. There's no way that I can do what's needed in this situation, but I know that you can. Now, part of that has to do with us being honest and open with God and confessing sin in our lives, okay? So it's going to be very difficult for us to approach a holy God with sin in our lives because the Holy Spirit of God lives in us once we become Christians and ask Jesus to be our Savior, and sin and the Holy Spirit don't work. So the Holy Spirit is going to continuously show us things in our lives that need to be dealt with. And if we don't deal with them, it's going to be very difficult to go to God and say, God, I need this or I need this or God, I love you so much. doesn't mean that God's going to turn his back on us, but we're talking about relationship. 
how strong is the relationship? And if there's sin in our lives, the relationship's not going to be strong, and we're not going to be wanting to communicate with God. We're going to be like Adam and Eve, hiding and saying, wow, God wants to speak to me, but no, God, I can't speak back to you. And the encouragement there is deal with sin in your life. One of the things I remember as a little boy growing up, it came to the Lord's Supper. And, um, you know, sometimes you would hear comments like, um, or I heard comments like, you know, uh, I'm not going to celebrate the Lord's Supper today because, you know, my heart's not right or I'm not in the right space. And, and I get that because that's a very serious thing. And, 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 and Paul tells us about that. Don't do this thing flippantly. For that reason, some of you have slept or died or the Lord had to take you home earlier. So it's not a thing to take lightly. But at the same time, it's not the thing to celebrate and say, well, oh, I'm not going to celebrate it. I'm just going to hold on to my sin. And when I feel like dealing with my sin, I'll go back to the Lord's Supper. It don't work like that. The whole point in which Paul is setting that up is be contemplative. Take some time before you take of the Lord's Supper. Figure out what's going on in your, in your life. If there's something that you have to confess, deal with it so that you can go ahead and create a closer relationship. And I remember doing that myself sometimes, you know, because I heard it and I thought, well, maybe that's the mature way of looking at it. Now, again, I'm not suggesting that, you know, if God is convicting you that you are not in the place to take the Lord's Supper, I get it. That's not what I'm talking about. But sometimes we can be very comfortable holding on to that thing and saying, well, you know what? Next Tuesday I'll do it, or the next time we do it, because you know what? I got to earn this stuff today. It's making me feel good, and I'll deal with it when I want to. Your relationship suffers. Your relationship with God suffers if that's the attitude of our hearts. So when we're talking about confession, Always remember the foundation of prayer. It's relational. If you have issues with your relationship with God, you're going to have issues with praying and communicating with God. That's for me too. Okay? That's just how it is. So we have to be honest about that. In Psalm 145, verse 18, it says this. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. In truth. That's what the Bible says. Psalm 145, verse 18. You and I have to learn to earn our own junk. It's just the way it is. And I'm not talking, this is like, this is just how I talk. This is how I relate to myself. When God shares me some stuff, I call it junk. I purpose to deal with it. I'm not perfect in that regard, but God's helping me in many respects. But it's junk. And the idea of junk is that you shouldn't have it around. No one wants junk in their house. Well, maybe, but that's another story. <laughs> you shouldn't want to have junk. Because junk means that maybe it's something there that has been overused, it should have been passed away or thrown out a long time ago, but you still have it hanging around, it's not helping you, but you still have it, and you're like, no, that's my stuff, no, it's junk. So God wants us to deal with our junk. He wants us to confess that we don't have what it takes to deal with our situation, but he also wants us to confess the junk that is hindering and clogging up the whole thing so that we can make a better relational connection with him, and pray. That make sense? All right. Thanksgiving, that's the next word that's used here. Thanksgiving, and guess what Thanksgiving means? Being thankful. Not real deep there, being thankful. The way in which this phrase appears in Philippians chapter 4 is simply this. It's like, well, we start with prayer. God, I adore you. I've been outside, God, and I see that you are an amazing God. I look in the oceans, and some have been whale watching, and I see the things that you have made. And the list goes on and on. You know, we look at the stars, and the scientists are learning more stuff, and they're figuring out new stuff, and it's amazing. So we learn to adore God, and then we learn to confess and be honest and open about what's going on. Well, this idea of thanksgiving is sort of sandwiched in there, which says, while we are praying, be amazed at the things that God has already done in your life, and just say thank you. You may not have it all together yet. You may still be smack in the middle of this most difficult thing that you've ever faced. But you've got to be able to look back over your life and just say, God, thank you. You know what? This is the worst thing that I'm going through. But you know what? I woke up this morning. Thank you. And I had some food and I got a job. To thank you, God. I'm still, I'm not through this thing yet. I'm not through it, but I'm learning to be thankful. And the idea is that thankfulness is sort of sprinkled through the prayer. Just sprinkled. Maybe it's not the focus. Maybe it's not like this is the only time or the only focus of your prayer, but it's sprinkled. 
just, just sprinkled. You know, you, you, God, I got to get, but oh, God, thank you so much. I remember when you did that. And then, God, you know what? I, I can't make it. I can't, but oh, thank you so much for that dear sister or dear brother there. It's sprinkled. It's sprinkled all through there. And that's the idea. One of the best ways to learn to be thankful, and I'm going to intentionally use the word learn because this is not stuff that just happens. We got to learn how to do it. Um, journaling is a great way to um, be thankful or to write down the things that you're thankful for because um, we are very prone to forget some of the things that God has done in our lives. So we might find ourselves in a very difficult situation and we absolutely completely forget what God already did in our lives. So just journal it. It doesn't have to be an essay. It doesn't have to be 10 pages long. Just say, God, you know what? Thank you. Thank you. I didn't think God's going to make it through today. Thank you. Um, and you know what? Um, that sister called me up at the right time, and that brother, they came to me at the right time. Just thank you. Just thank you. You just, you just write thank you. And so when it's time for the sprinkling to take place, you got some stuff that you've been sort of rehearsing. The other thing about journaling is this, writing stuff down helps you remember it, okay? So writing it down forces your brain to do two things. Usually when we read something, uh, we just try to remember it. That's one. But writing it down, the brain actually engages in two ways, so it actually helps us to remember it better. So writing down stuff is good. Um, so, so, so learn to do that. Psalm, 10, Psalm 100, 1 to 5 says this. Um, shout for the joy, so, shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. So we have to learn to be thankful. We have to be in a habit of being thankful. And that doesn't just mean saying thanks for your food. That's great and we have to do that. But if we just do it as a rehearsed thing, then it's not so relational. If it's a God, you know what, I just watched that video and there are people around the world who have nothing and, but here I sit and I have food, thank you. Thank you. Relational. But all of us have to learn to be thankful. So we have to work at that. The last word that is there in Philippians 4 is request. And the idea with request is be specific. It's be specific. So it's the idea of, um, as Pastor Chip Ingram would say, it's the idea of writing your shopping list down and giving it to God, not leaving anything out, even putting in the extras, but you write it down, be specific, be specific, be specific. God, I need you to do this. God, I'm not going to make it through this because my heart is in this place. God, you know my finances. God, general prayer, prayers are great, and God is big enough to handle our general prayers, but if you're honest, how do we know God answered it if we're not asking specific prayers? The Bible says that God, his blessings, they rain on the just and the unjust because God's a good God. But what Paul is encouraging us to do here is be specific. Be specific. Now, this is something that sometimes I struggle with, and I'm sure I'm probably not the only one, because general prayers sort of put us in a nice space because then we're not really accountable for like being disappointed and it's just like, well, God, you know, get me home today. Praise God, we need to pray that prayer. But God, while I'm going home, would you help me to prepare my heart for what I'm going home to? I'm gonna walk into a situation that's not comfortable, God. I want you to get me home, but God, will you help me to have the right heart? Will you help me to respond in the right way? Be specific. And so this is the other word that God has Paul right in here so that we understand that prayer is communication, it's based on relationship, but there are different kinds of prayers that all come together to enhance our relationship and our communication with God. Nothing becomes dynamic until it becomes specific. Nothing becomes dynamic until it becomes specific. And so sometimes, and again, this is a challenge that God has to convict me of sometimes, I can pray to God, God, will you bless my marriage? Now, I want God to bless my marriage, but what I really should be praying is, God, will you fix me in my stubbornness at times, in my unwillingness to maybe do what I should do, so that what I'm bringing to my marriage enhances my spouse and my marriage. 
That's the difference between praying a general prayer and a specific prayer. It could be, even as it relates to my, my children, I love them so much, sometimes I feel as if I, I let them down, I disappoint myself at times, and I can pray, God, you know what, would you help me just to, to love them better? I want him to do that. But that's a pretty big word. What does that mean? God, would you help me to spend more time with them individually? Would you help me to balance this thing? God, will you help me, even if I'm tired, to set myself aside and just sit there and listen to one of my kids? Would you help me to put away my phone and just get down on Isaiah's level and just look him in the eyes and say, what up? what's up, boy? That's the specific stuff. When it comes to ministry, God, would you help me to get there on time? Yeah, great, that's a big thing. I'm gonna encourage you, get to your ministry on time. But, okay, we're on, we're on time, but you're miserable. That's a, an example, that's an example. <laughs> That's an example. But it's God, get me to my ministry on time, but while I'm driving there, God, this ministry scares me to death. I believe you called me to it, but you know my heart, and sometimes I don't really want to be there because I'm not really a people person. But God, would you help me specifically to have a heart that's burdened for people that when I see them and I smile, it's not just this forced thing. It's a, wow, I am so glad to see you. God, would you help me be specific? we got to be specific with God. Some of us work in working environments which are just not good, if we're honest. And so we want to get in and we want to go out. I understand that. And I'm not necessarily saying that's a bad thing. As God leads you, you do what he wants you to do. But while you're there, don't just lock yourself off in your little cube and say, well, I'm doing my thing and the boss ain't going to say nothing to me and I'm done my thing and I'm going to race out of here. No, it might be a prayer that says, God, I specifically need you to help me to open up, share my faith in whatever way that I can so that it's not just a nine to five, but God, I need you to specifically do this in my life. This is very, very important. And this is something that God continuously challenges me with. Uh, one of the things that, um, well, Hopefully you don't know this about me, but I'll just share it. It's something that God's been growing in me. But I, I'm an introvert. I, I love people. I like hanging out with people. But there are times when hanging out with people scares me to death. All right? Um, you know, it, it may sound, sound humorous to you that, you know, I can be in front of people and, and what have you. But this is something that God had to teach me and still teaches me and he used the times when I led worship to do it. I remember when I first came to Cornerstone and God had already convinced me that he had given me a gift to music and sing and stuff. And I said, okay, that's cool. But um, I like to work hard. I like to work hard. I will, if you put me in the background, I will work. I will have no complaints because I like to work. I have no problem working. But being out in front of people, I'm not really feeling that part. I'm not really feeling that. So there was a long process of me getting comfortable just being in front of people. Now, when I say comfortable, I don't mean like, oh, I got this and I'm ready to do it. I just mean literally moving from there to here. <laughs> but, so it's not even as much as I've been, I'm not even comfortable now. It's not that I've got this thing, it's that God has taught me how to stand before his people to do a specific thing that he's asked me to do. So that was a specific prayer that I had to pray. And it was a specific prayer that I think God was answering even before I was praying it, because I really wasn't praying it because I didn't want to get in front of people. But singing in front of people used to scare me to death. You know, I would get up, I would sing, I'm out of here. Um, and then, you know, it was just like learning to be not in so much control. So my, my wife would know this well. You know, if I were to sing at my former church or whatever, you know, I would usually be tracks and, you know, I'd be up like 7 o'clock in the morning, like, you know, lemon juice, warmed up, all that stuff, and I would sing this song to death so that when I sang it, it would be what it was supposed to be, and then I would go home. But then you come into a situation where God's saying, oh, you ready to sing? Well, no. Like, you know, I haven't practiced this morning. You seriously want me to go and do this like now, like in two minutes? Completely different situation. I've had to learn that. I'm still learning it, still not comfortable with it. But what I am comfortable with more and more is asking God, to do specific things in my life so that I can do the thing that he's asked me to do. We gotta be specific. We gotta be specific. And I'm hoping that every single person in here can identify that specific thing that you know you need God to do in your life. So instead of praying, God bless me, God 
that's fine. But after that, we got to get down to the nitty gritty, which is God, this is the area specifically that I need you to work in my life. I got some family issues going on, God, and I don't even like you. Huh? God, I need you to specifically help me to love mom and dad today, or my brother or sister, or this or that. Specifics. That's what God is after. So when we look at this in the whole context now, do not be anxious. Life can be anxious. Jesus already told us, in this world, you will have some trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. Trouble equates to anxiety. That's just the way that it happens. But it isn't what God wants us to experience. He says, but in every situation, not some situations, not the situations that I'm most comfortable with, every situation, he says, by prayer, by putting God in his rightful place, and by petitioning, confessing, being honest that we can't handle it, but God can, with thanksgiving, sprinkle it all in there, because whether you like it or not, whether you're willing to acknowledge it or not, God has been good to you. Then he says, present your requests to God. Be specific. Be specific. And with that, I want to encourage you, don't try to be specific for the person sitting next to you. Yeah, you know why I'm like, yeah. <laughs> be specific for yourself. Be specific for yourself. God has so much in store for us. So the question then comes up, if we learn to pray like this, and again, this isn't a formula, this is based on relationship, but this is sort of the procedure that God would want us to understand as we approach him based on that relationship. But what can we expect from God? So I understand how to do this. God's going to help me work it out, but what can I expect? Should I only expect that the thing that I pray for, bam, done? Well, if God has led you to pray that, keep praying it. But that isn't the only thing that we should expect from God. And this is where I think we have to be completely honest with God and let him blow what we think about prayer away. And the peace of God, verse 7, which trans all, transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Sometimes we can get to a place where we will be adamant that God does what I want him to do when I want him to do it, and that is the only way in which I will know he's heard me and he's answered my prayer. But what if, as we're learning how to approach God, what if God is wanting us to understand that approach based on relationship and continue to communicate with him and continue to talk to him. What if in all of that God says, i am heard you, I'm taking it all into consideration, I'm the sovereign now, I'm gonna work it out all for your good, but while I'm working it out, I want you to have my peace. That is the expectation that every single one of us should have. It isn't that God is absolutely, automatically, all the time gonna do the thing that we prayed for, but what we can expect of God based on this verse is his peace. Now, the challenge with that is this, Sometimes, if we're honest, and we're going to dig a little deeper, if we're honest, there are some of us in here right now that blame God for stuff that's happened in our lives. God, you didn't answer that prayer when I needed you to answer it. You didn't do what I asked you to do. So there's no way that I can trust you. Some of us are here, and we believe in God, but we're blaming God, and that will never lead to trusting God. Some of us are here and we believe God, but we're also blaming God, and that will never lead to trusting God. So the question is this, do you hold anything against God? Do you blame him for things that have happened in your life? Now, I'm just talking about the reality of difficult times that we have to go through. If God's sovereign, God knows what he's doing. It doesn't always make us feel good, but there are some times that we can hold on to stuff and we blame God that it didn't come through. I had a cousin that just passed away last week. Wonderful saint, she loved Jesus with all her heart. The influence that she had around the world was amazing. And we prayed, we prayed, we prayed, but God in his sovereignty said, no, I know what's best, I'm gonna take her home. Maybe you're here and, you know, there's a situation that you are just not comfortable with and you have been pleading with God over and over and over and over again and he has not changed it. And so 
you're trying to trust God, but you don't because you still blame him and you're holding him accountable for things that you think he should have done differently in your life and in my life. There are things that happen to family members sometimes that, you know, God, if only, and I get it, I prayed those prayers. I've been in those same situations. I was there just recently. But if we don't understand what God really wants us to have, we're going to lose sight as we wait for him to do the thing that we're asking him to do. What God wants you and I to experience while we entrust our issues to him is his peace. Sometimes we can be so adamant that I want this thing now and I want it this way and this is the only way that it should work out. That we miss the thing that God is actually wanting to give us. So we're over here demanding what we want. God is there ready to give us what he knows we need, but we don't receive it because we're still over here. And what God is saying is this. Life's difficult. Jesus already told us that. Everybody in here has their own story. Yes, I'm big enough to handle your issues. I'm big enough to put the whole thing in perspective for your good. Sometimes that's difficult for us to understand because we don't see it. But what God would have each and every one of us understand is while you entrust yourself, your issues, and all the rest of it to me, while I'm working it out, because I am, I love you way too much to just say it doesn't matter. I'm not up there having a party because you're down here crying. That's not God. God doesn't get excited when we hurt. God doesn't just push buttons and say, well, nope, you can't handle that, so whatever, don't care. That's not God. But if we think that that's our God, then we're going to have some trouble because we're going to blame God. God, why didn't you? And I've had those questions, so I'm speaking to myself as well. But the thing that sometimes we want so much is not necessarily the thing that God says that we need. And regardless of what you and I go through, what we can expect of God as we understand how to pray to him is his peace. It's his peace. So we all need to get to a place where we want what God wants us to have because what he wants us to have is exactly what we need. A lot of words. Let's read that again. We need to get to a place where we want what God wants us to have, which is his peace, because what he wants us to have is exactly what we need. Would you be honest with God today and say, you know what, God? Maybe I've had the wrong expectations. Now, that's not to say again that God will not change our situations. But God in his sovereignty decides when, if, where, how. And the Bible tells us that he works all of that out for our good. We have to believe that. But while he's working it out, while he is working it out, while he is doing exactly what he said he will do, and he is, he does, he does that. But while he's doing that, will we be honest with God and say, God, this is what I really want. But while you're working it out for me, I'm going to receive what you know I really need, which is your peace. That is the expectation that every single one of us can have when it comes to difficult times in our lives, when we pray. Doesn't mean that tomorrow the thing's gone. Doesn't mean that a new job is tomorrow or this. And, and it's difficult. And I get it. We lose loved ones and we pray and we, you know. But what if what God is wanting us to have immediately, right now, is his peace? So it's the idea that God, with your peace, I'm going to take one step today, as difficult as it is. And tomorrow I'm going to take another step. And tomorrow I'm going to take another step. And the next day I'm going to take another step. And then it's one week gone. And then it's another week gone. And then it's a month gone. And four months. And then it's a year gone. And it's another year. And when we reflect, we say, God, that was the hardest thing that I have ever been through in my life. And I wish I'd never have to go through it again. But, oh, God, your peace was part of my experience all the way through that. God's faithful. God's faithful. He gives us what we need. And while he is working out the details in your life and my life, he wants us to experience his peace. 
He wants us to experience his peace. So let's not lose sight of that. Come on, let's have the musicians come, and I'm going to invite you to stand. Let's stand before our God today. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request. Present the details to him, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We're going to have an altar call this morning, and we're just going to come right down here. And the altar call is going to be, God, will you help me to be honest with you? Will you help me to learn to worship you and adore you? Will you help me to confess what needs to be confessed? Will you help me, God, to be thankful for the things you've already done in my life? And will you help me to be specific with the areas in my life that need to change? If God has spoken to your heart, I want to invite you to come right down here right now. Let's not take too long. Let's just come and we're going to pray together. Because at the end of the day, there are going to be circumstances that you and I face they're going to bring about anxiety. They're going to bring about some doubts. They're going to bring about some stuff that we have to deal with, but we may not want to deal with. But we have to learn that as we approach our holy God, we can entrust him with every part of our story. And he will work it out. But while he's working it out, he wants us to experience his peace. Learn to expect what God wants us to expect and not what we think we deserve and demand from him. Father, thank you, God, for showing up today, God. I thank you, Father, that you've reminded us, God, all over again just how much you love us, God, and how much you can't wait to spend time with us in prayer, God. Help us, God, to work through the things that hinder us, God, with your grace, because the only thing that matters, God, is that we have a close relationship with you. Help us, God. Help us to know that you are near, God. You aren't a God who is a distant God who looks and says, well, I hope they know, God. You're a God who wants to be up close and personal with us, God. Help us to want the same with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. God bless you. Our service is over. Please come out on Tuesday as we pray together. Have a great week. God bless you. This message has been brought to you by Cornerstone Bible Fellowship Bermuda. To connect with us, visit us at www.cornerstone.bm or if you have a prayer request, email us at prayer at cornerstone.bm.